That was too much fun for me. I will just say, for the record, I love talking about sex. This wasn't always the case, um, and it might not be the case for you, but I just I think that my uh, my not wanting to talk about sex was rooted in a lot of shame. I had a lot of shame about my desire, about what I wanted. Um, and I, I was never taught to ask for what, how, to get, how to get my needs met or like how to do things. So um, my journey towards what uh, many call sex positivity uh, started out with like me being okay with being gay, with pretty much being a fundamentalist in every other way. Um, and it was through my first relationship, which was not missed with a very, very lovely man that uh, uh, just was very, very codependent, um, that I kind of started questioning all these things because what I saw coming out of that was bad fruit, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, so um, that caused me, that's what caused me to re-examine all my stuff. And so my process of uh, learning how to form a new kind of sexual ethic that's still based on the Bible because I love the Bible. I'm a seminary, I'm kind of a Bible nerd. Um, with all the complicated things that it is, um, I still think that uh, I want to be able to explain it to my mom. You know, I think oftentimes we prize experience over everything and we just jettison the rest of Christian tradition. And that's what you need to do. Jettison everything if that's what you need to do. But for those of us who remain in Christian traditions, oftentimes we find ourselves having to defend ourselves or we don't know. We have a practice, but we don't know, you know, theologically how to back it up. This is how I theologically back it up, um, how I think about it, and also I just don't care what, you know, I don't care what non-affirming people think, um, frankly. So like, um, I think any, I'll just say this too, I believe that any sexual ethic that says, uh, that, you, that prescribes that you have to wait until marriage uh, to have sex is harmful. I would also say that anything that would say that sexual, uh, queer people, um, queer and trans folk, or anything less than completely beloved and included in the family of God, I think that is sinful. And I think that is uh, not okay, I think it's toxic. Yeah. Um, nice. um, and I make no, and I, I make no, and I'll, at the same time I'll say I'm very committed to QCM, and I love it, and I don't, honestly, like, I don't care about the divide that we have. That's another story completely. I would just want to say, like, if you are somebody who's sitting on the fence right now, continue to support QCF because we need this organization to survive. Um, also, one more thing, before I get into the meat of this thing, I want you to take a moment and notice my shoes. <laughs> I'm very, I love them so much. Oh, here. Um, and now I'm going to take them off. Because I am what? A Proverbs 31 woman, and a Proverbs 31 woman is what's wise. Do what? You have to be able to see your Argyle. Yes, of course, because it's Argyle's Saturday. For those of you who remember Argyle Saturday. Why is that not on the screen? What's happening? Oh, boom. You're like, oh, perfect. So, I believe we have to examine what we think we know. Today, we are talking about, uh, again, examine what we think we know. A fancy stool, sexy poetry, feet, fruit, mowage, and then doing it. <laughs> are you guys ready? Yes. I skipped through apparently a few things. There it is, part one. That's what I want. Um, just from the floor, um, what did you hear about sex growing up? Nothing. Nothing. I'm hearing a lot of nothing. It was wrong. Say what? For you got from your parents, what did your parents say? Oh, it's a little book I read. Oh, just a little book they just handed you. Oh, cute. Um, I hope that wasn't condescending. I don't. I didn't mean to be that. I'm just very sarcastic. My virginity is like a rose. Your virginity is a rose. Only should be had if you want children. Only you need to have procreative sex, only if you want children. I learned about it online. You learned about it online? Come on, Tumblr. Oh, R.I.P. Tumblr. <laughs> <laughs> we keep it relevant here. I'm just telling you. Your mother drew you a picture. Was it accurate? We don't know. Oh, God. <laughs> it wasn't accurate, y'all. I have to be modest, and anything that happens to me is my fault. Anything that happens to you is your fault. I have to be modest, and anything is my fault. Yeah, we all got a lot of really weird stuff. I grew up believing that sex was for a man and a woman, um, and that I was gross. That's what I pretty much learned. Um, so um, I think a lot of times um, this is our um, experience of sex. <laughs> let's, just, let's just dive into this, shall we? Oh, can she hear it? Hold on, hold up, check me out. I don't know how to, but he says, like, don't have sex. You'll get chlamydia, and I just don't have sex, okay? Now, everybody take a rubber. 
I had watched this so many times. In this scene, he says, "Don't get pregnant because you'll get preg you'll get a uh, you'll, you'll get pregnant and die." That's the one in this one. <laughs> Um, newsflash, if you didn't know, the Bible actually doesn't offer a consistent ethic on sex and marriage. The Bible has a lot to say about what it means to be pure. It has a lot to say about, um, like Song of Solomon says, do not awaken of your heart until it so desires. It doesn't say anything about marriage. Until your heart, like, do not awaken love until it desires. Ooh, well, what does desire mean? <sighs> oh, honey. <laughs> um, I, I, I believe that it doesn't offer a, a, a a consistent sexual ethic, and I, what I do, just like with, um, you know, queer affirming theology, I like to use the, um, what's called the redemptive movement hermeneutic, which is where we look at the Bible and we say, okay, it's talking about this particular topic, and it seems to be moving in this direction. So, for example, Old Testament, slavery is dope. New Testament, I mean, slaves exist, but just like you need to treat them like your brothers and sisters in Christ. Abolitionism got a hold of it and said, oh my God, our experience is telling us we see black bodies being destroyed and owned and traded and things being separated. That's not right, which triggered their reason, which said, um, okay, maybe we should re-examine this, which goes back to the tradition. Tradition said slavery was dope, and it makes us a lot of money. And it said, that's not good enough. Tradition is wrong. Tradition is hurting people. It's producing bad fruit. So we go back to scripture, and what does it say? There's neither male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile in Christ Jesus. They said, boom, we have to do something about this. That's where I get a lot of my stuff. Because if you really want to look at the Bible, it, there's eight ways to have a biblical marriage. <laughs> man and woman, man, wives, concubines, man, woman, woman's property. Uh, we have uh, polygyny, which is man plus woman plus woman plus woman, which is not the same as polyamory. Uh, man plus brothers, widows, and a love right marriage, which is a story of like kinsman, redeemer, which we're going to get into in a little bit. But it's still kind of weird. No, kinsman, redeemer is a different thing. <laughs> That one was gross, though, anyways. Um, did you know the Bible says if a man rapes a woman, he has to marry her? Yeah. Yeah. Or pay the father, like, 40 shekels of silver because apparently a woman is worth 40 shekels of silver. Dope. Cool. I love that Bible. <laughs> We've got uh, prisoners of wars plus the male soldiers. That's called rape. Um, and we have a male plus a female slave where a slave owner can actually tell uh, you and you are going to uh, procreate so I can have more work around the house. And it's justified in the Bible. Weird, right? But we don't think about that marriage that way anymore. We don't think that this is okay. So why is it uh, that non-affirming people can't like get it through their head? But what do I know? I'm just living this experience. So question, how did you become affirming of your LGBTQ identity and queer relationships? I'm a lesbian. Rock and roll. I'm a lesbian. I, so uh, how else did anybody else, how did you become here? Hell fucking yeah. Oh, I also like cuss a lot. And sorry, <laughs> but I'm not. Um, anyone else? Take gender away from God. Say that again? Take gender away from God. Yeah. Unpack that. What does that mean? Take gender away from God. To, when I realized that God doesn't have gender, mm. that was when I could explore. Ooh, that's good. More. That God doesn't have a gender which allowed him to explore his sexuality more um, because God does not, in fact, have a penis. <laughs> People talk about the hand of God, and it's like, listen, I don't think God has like anthropomorphic hands either, but like, you know, maybe I'm weird. So that leads me to what I kind of talked about and touched about a little bit, the Wesleyan quadrilateral, which is yes. made up of, listen, I, all my Methodist friends want me Methodist, all my Lutheran friends want me Lutherans, and I'm just a mystic witch sometimes, I don't know. <laughs> I literally, I have a crystal in my front pocket right now, yes. because I'm nervous, and she reminds me I'm okay. Scripture, tradition, reason, experience. I think of this kind of like a weird cycle. I wish I would have put it in a circle instead. But it's always uh, our experiences which drive us back to Scripture for reinterpretation, right? We've done it with, uh, well, we're still working through racial justice, obvi. Um, but we, you know, abolition, that happened uh, within American history and is still working towards that. Um, I'd also throw in there um, the elevation and equality of women, even though it's still super un unequal. You know, from where we were to now, there's been progress. Um, and it's always been our experience which drove us back to scripture to ask, did we get this wrong? And I think the same thing is happening with sex. Um, because in our experiences with, um, the, uh, with our experiences with, with sex and like how it was so like, we know that abstinence only teaching doesn't really work. And it's because A, it's shame based. That's why it doesn't work. 
because we're constantly telling people your desire is wrong. You're telling a normal, healthy teenage human who just literally is discovering their body that the way it was naturally designed to be is wrong. And that's weird. And we carry that with us all the way into all adult world. And I don't like that. So I try to go back into it. Um, I, and again, I don't like to jettison the Bible because I believe that uh, on the days when I still am a Christian, which is most days, and I think if I'm considering to continue seminary, I should probably like try to at least be a believer sometimes. I don't know. <laughs> what, is, what is time? What is life? Everything's a construct. Um, could I please get a volunteer to read? And uh, just forewarning, it's going to be a juicy passage. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to go with my, my, my band sister over here. You ready? Sure. Okay, take a deep breath. You got this. <laughs> You don't have to, by the way, but it's just like, it's no, 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 my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> totally down. My beloved thrust his hand into the opening, mm. and my innermost being yearned for him. I arose to open to my beloved, mm. and my hands dripped with myrrh. My fingers with liquid myrrh. Upon the handles of the bolt, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned and was gone. That bitch. <laughs> Also, shout out to you for like the dramatic reading of this. Come on. What do we have here, Barbara? That is a woman having sex with her man, and then when he finishes, he just up and leaves. That's messed up. It's so interesting to me because like everyone's like, "Oh my God, it's just an allegory for Christ in the church." I'm like. That's an allegory? I don't know what kind of relationship you have with Jesus. Well, that's a little less wild and more mild, you know what I'm saying? The Bible is full of, not full, that's a nothing, but the Bible does have texts like this where we can actually say, but you know what? This is an example of somebody owning their sexuality. This is an example of somebody being able to say, um, I'm having an experience that can create art and beauty out of it. Even though, like, it's totally effed up what he did. He just, like, dipped out, and she's like, where the hell did you go? I just said I was going to go to the bathroom for, like, one second. Rude. <laughs> also, like, God, that's so hot, though, right? <laughs> uh, all right, I'm going to read this next one uh, just to be through. So this is the story of Ruth. For those of you who don't know, the, the book of Ruth has, at the very beginning of it, a story of uh, uh, Ruth, Naomi, and the other sister-in-law, who I can't remember who, married into Naomi's family through their sons. They died. And so Naomi was like, well, this sucks. Um, go back to the land of your forefathers. And Naomi says right before this, super queer, do not ask me to turn back from you. For where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. And where you die, may I be buried also. And may I be dealt with, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me, which is used in most evangelical Christian marriages. <laughs> And it was two women. I think they had something queer going on, IMO, but I don't know. But also, like, I think about it just like it queers relationships, right? That kind of really deep connection yeah. with someone not based on, maybe not even based on sex, but just deep desire to be a different kind of family. We're going to get into that later. Naomi and her mother, well, actually, I'm not going to read this. I'm going to tell you what happens. Uh, Naomi says to Ruth, hey, girl, um, we need to find somebody to help save us from poverty because both my sons died. And we don't have an income, so what I want you to do, go up to the threshing floor, which is where everybody partied, and you said, wait till um, Boaz, Mighty Boaz, I'm waiting on my mother, Mighty Boaz, honey. <laughs> Our kinsman, specifically next to kin, was supposed to marry the, the, the wife and provide for them, that's how it's supposed to work. Love right marriage or something. I'm probably not getting that right. I'm going to ask my professor when I get home. Um, anyways, go down there, and then once he's drunk and passed out, uh, uncover his feet. Um, and just wait. And then, so basically, she's like, all right, cool. And so next scene, she goes down to the threshing floor and it's like, she's all bougied up. She smells good, her her day. And then when, she, when Boaz is drunk and in a contented mood, which is what I was, hey, mom, I can't talk right now. I'm in a contented mood. So. <laughs> mom, shut up. 
<laughs> That's never happened before to me. Um, he goes, uh, uncovers his feet, and that's a euphemism to like, if, if he's not naked, you should probably undress him and like lie with him. And the whole plot was, you lie with him, he's gonna wake up in the morning because he's drunk and he's gonna say, oh my God, I slept with this woman, and by Jewish law, that means I'm married to her, I have to take care of her, thank God, Naomi and Ruth are saved. Weird consent thing there, obviously, so that's problematic. But let's see what happens next. Boaz ain't drunk. Not as drunk as uh, she thinks he is. And he wakes up in the middle of the night and says, girl, what are you doing in my bed? Why are you, why am I naked? And she's like, you're my kinsman redeemer or something like that. Will you please love me? And he, she's like, well, okay, yeah, because I know that this is my duty and I will love you. And then he says, what? Um, I think in the next one, do I have another slide? I can't remember. Yes, there we go. Lie down until the morning, which is a Jewish euphemism for what? Yes. There you go. Good job, everybody. So here we have another example of sex outside of marriage. Because they didn't get married. They didn't get married. <coughs> Not in the way that we think of traditional covenantal marriage, which is fine. Um, because what came out of this? The line that led to Jesus Christ. So I'm not saying that the Bible says to have sex outside of marriage. I'm just saying there's precedent. <laughs> I get a lot of my ethic from thinking about um, uh, the fruit of things. I say, like, Jesus said, you are going to know a tree by its what? By its fruit. <laughs> Come on, euphemism. <laughs> You're gonna know a tree by its fruit. And so when I look at the tree of an ethic that says, uh, you have to save sex for marriage, that's the only way that sex is okay. Including in, in, it's not in all queer circles, I think, I just got off a panel next door where like it was like, I actually really enjoyed it. Even though I had people say, I'm saving sex for marriage, but I honestly like, that's what's good for me. Again, descriptive, not prescriptive. That's where I live. And so I'll say for me, like, anything that motivates you by shame is bad fruit. Anything that says your sexuality, your desire is wrong, is bad fruit. And you know it because it stinks. Like, life sucks when you are carrying shame around. So let's get rid of that. Uh, so what does shame cause? Shame causes hiding, right? Um, Pornhub does this really cool thing every single year. <laughs> Didn't see that coming, did you, Bar? <laughs> Pornhub does this thing every year. Um, ironically, what happened was apparently this like, genius started buying up all of these porn sites and like just like uploading them. And, like, now he owns the porn industry. And what he does is he distributes all the search terms um, and puts it into infographics that people can learn and understand. And like people can actually do a qualitative study on people's uses of porn. This is a map in the United States of the most searched porn terms in 2018. You can see. And I, may I remind you that in some of the most conservative states, we have some of the most, um, we'll say, interesting search terms. You'll see up there in the Midwest, stepsister, stepmom, cartoon. I mean, work. I'm not here to kink shame. That's just, I've never experienced that. Um, and when you drill down into the data even further, there are things like for sex as search terms, which is called rape. Um, you drag it down even further, there's incest. Very, very um, intense, uh, darker, darker things, darker, darker things, darker, darker things. And when you think about also the fact that um, in the porn industry, there's a disproportionate number of women who are being trafficked and forced into it, it becomes really problematic. I'm not here to shame porn use. I'm here to say, make sure you know where you're getting your porn from, because if you can source it ethically, please do. Um, but all to say is that shame causes people to hide. So, and you've, you've heard the story over and over again, right? Pastor has a porn addiction, we have to kick him out. Pastor, you know, had all of these desires, and he was cheating on his wife, because it's always a white man cheating on his wife. Um, I also, like, I have this thing sometimes where I just, like, name white people. I don't hate white people, I just want to say that. I love you, I have a problem with whiteness, um, and white supremacy. Also, I want to say shout out to all the people of color who actually came to QCF. You have to put up with a lot, and I'm really, really grateful for your presence here. Um, and we need you to make us better, so please, as much as you can, like, tell us off, please. Um, so, if shame produces bad fruit and causes us to hide, um, it causes us to have compulsions. And I want to say this too, like people will say like, you know, sex can become addictive, or sex can do all these other things. Um, and I just want to point out, like, it's the same, like, when people compare, like, addiction and compulsion, I think there's a, a, a difference, and I'm not a trained psychologist, but we'll note that right there. Um, but this is based on qualitative research, right? 
Addiction has drastic uh, physical consequences for uh, withdrawal, right? So if uh, any of us uh, who have friends who are in recovery from uh, narcotics know, it's really, like, when they have withdrawal, it is pain. It is painful. Alcohol withdrawal is painful. Um, compulsion, on the other hand, has a strong mental drive, and it's almost just like, I don't know what I'm doing, like my animal instincts take over. But if I don't jack off, I'm not going to have a seizure, right? <laughs> yes? I have to contest that. that. I mean, that's not really compulsion and addiction, really, because you're talking about withdrawal. Mm -hmm. They might cut you off. Mm -hmm. People who have addictions and live that way don't feel physical withdrawal symptoms years after, but mm -hmm. they certainly have mental. Yes. Which is still addiction. It's not compulsion, not just not like, it's a lot more compulsion, it's also part of addiction. Too. Yeah. That's part of it. I'm into it. I just want, I just want to people to say, like, I don't want them to think that it's, don't self-diagnose yourself. Oh yeah, don't self-diagnose yourself. I, again, I'm not a trained psychologist. Right. Um, but this is, this is uh, I guess for me, when I think about, um, when I think about desire, or I think about this, I think that a lot of people, like, they have a porn addiction because they can't talk about their own desire. But you are right, there is a mental part of it. Thank you for your feedback. One more. Um, I'm not arguing at all with you, but I am a recovering porn addict. And when you're giving that up, there is mm. literal physical symptoms of withdrawal. Mm. When you're giving up a behavioral addiction, like you are fatigued, you are exhausted, mm. it hurts, it causes aches and pains. Yeah. So that's a thing too I just want to add. I received that. Yeah. I withdraw this. Forget everything I said. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I want to get to though. This is where this is all leading. And thank you, and thank you. I do appreciate that. I appreciate what you're doing right now. Oh my god. Don't, don't butter me up, I'm vegan. I'm not vegan. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just think it's a funny joke. Um, this is, okay, so this is what I was kind of going to get at. Because, like, did you grow up and you were saying, just like, don't touch yourself, you'll go blind, right? <laughs> And also, women were just taught not to have sexuality, so like, like a lot stereotypically, women don't experience orgasm as much or know what masturbation is until later in life, which sucks. Um, not even the fun way, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but masturbation is good for you. And so, like for me, growing up, it was just like every single time I would go to youth group and I had to get in the group, just like, well, like I masturbated again. <laughs> were you watching porn? No. <laughs> And so we feel the shame thing, and so just like, you know, it's like, you know, don't think about a unicorn who's snorting rainbow cocaine. What are you thinking about? Um, so now, don't think about masturbation. What are you thinking about? I thought about it all the time, that's all I wanted to do because I couldn't, I had this shame cycle that just like ruled me. And so actually now that you guys, now that I'm saying it out loud, I'm just, you guys are absolutely right on that last point. It ruled me. And um, the thing about it is, is like, people who masturbate typically have less stress, uh, they sleep better, that's for damn sure, at least I do. Um, and also, and also it's, it's, it's the safest sex that you can have, you know? And also, of course, I mean, if you don't know, also I wanna say this, um, this applies to people who um, experience sexual attraction who are allosexual. If you're an asexual person, you experience these things very differently, and I'm not that person, but we're not, so go to an asexual workshop. Um, because they're, also, we need to learn more about asexuality, including myself, so just note to everybody. Um, boob. Question. Which community of people tends to have higher self-esteem, better communication skills, excellent resilience and coping skills, as well as reporting having better sex? Lesbians. Lesbians. Masturbators, lesbians. Who? Poly folks. Probably not Christians. <laughs> Probably not Christians! Yes! That's it, that's it. See, this is why I love presenting, because everybody's involved in this. <laughs> Boom. BDSM and kink communities. Seriously, because BDSM, kink, is all about consent. Naming what you want, naming your desires. And also, I would say like they have to communicate their feelings more. They have to communicate what they want, what they don't want, where their boundaries are. Um, and they do it in pursuit of just like wanting to give each other pleasure. That's a good thing. Why is it having more love in the world a bad thing? Um, so, I think we need to take a cue from them. Like, naming our desires is a really, really good thing. Um, I, I think there's also this other part. We have an, an obsession with um, nuclear family as society. Like, we just, we, uh, we 
canonize and hold in high esteem relationship, nuclear family, marriage, much to the detriment of single people. Now this is single people across the world, whether you are choosing to be celibate side B, or you're an asexual person, or you're just somebody who just happens to be single for whatever reason. We do not build our communities for, for single people sometimes, which is what I love about queer theory and queer ideas and um, ideas that come from a poly and non-monogamous community, because they talk about building different kinds of families. And I think Jesus did this a lot. I mean, he traveled around with his people. He said, who is my mother? Who is my brother? It's the person who's going on the journey with me. You know, the girls who were financing and keeping it all together and the boys who just like, didn't get anything Jesus was saying half the time. <laughs> so Jesus models for us this beautiful way of building community that's outside of this. And I also want to say, what is the fruit of certain kinds of marriages, at least in the history of this country? Uh, I looked it up, we're down to 40% divorce rate among marriages. And that's only because people are getting, uh, they see the correlation of people getting later, married later in life and not forcing themselves into, we have to have children, or we have to do X, Y, and Z. Now, if you are like me and you grew up in evangelical culture, that's not true. You know, my brother got married at 22, and I'm just like, so, <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm sure it's gonna last because like they're great, but also just like, oh, it scares me. Or like you went to that Bible college, and never have I ever been to a Bible college, anyone? Yeah. They should bring by spring, exactly. They're obsessed with it. And so, what I believe about family and relationship in general is that we should be uh, creating deep kinship with one another. And that doesn't necessarily mean like, I'm gonna have sex with you, but it does mean that I'm committed to you. There was a really great question I got in a workshop one time was, what if we treat our lover more like our friends and our friends more like our lovers? Our lovers, or you know, if you're in a monogamous relationship, there's almost this expectation, um, and I'll say this is in my experience. Um, I, I thought that having a boyfriend meant I need to give him my time, my attention, my love, my devotion, my respect, and, that, and also that um, you know, he has access to my body because when you, you have sex with people you're in a relationship with, and so that turned into some really abusive shit for me because I believed in this very, very, very strict way of doing relationship, and I'm gonna be committed no matter what because that's what good Christians do. Let me tell you what, honey. Look at me now. <laughs> so that is something that... Uh, I'm not about. I'm not about that. I'm about creating different kinds of relationships. I don't know why I'm looking at my notes. I'm so far behind on this. I don't need them anyways. All right. So my question is like, this is like just like the top things I can think about. What is the risk of abstinence-only sexual ethic where you're saying you have to save sex until marriage? Sex is bad. Sex is not good, which is like purity culture bullshit we all grew up in, right? Not all of us, I don't know your experience. I had a friend in here who grew up liberal, and was like, what that, what's that like? What's it like growing up without shame? I don't get it. Um, increased teen pregnancy, it has been shown that if schools teach abstinence-only sex, you know what happens? And you don't tell it, talk about contraception, or birth control, or uh, something more substantial like, uh, you know, like uh, that STIs aren't a bad thing, they just happen to happen. Um, Two, increase risky behavior. This is also especially true around LGBT folks because when we are in the closet, some, at least, uh, I know this isn't, like, I engaged a lot of risky sexual behavior with, um, with just like hooking up with people. Um, didn't know what I was doing, uh, didn't use condoms. Um, you know, the whole nine years because I was ashamed. I wanted to get quick, I wanted that intimacy so badly. I wanted somebody to just touch my body to say like, this is good. And then immediately I left and I felt shame. If that's the fruit of an abstinence only sexual ethic that says you have to wait till marriage, I'm not about that. So my question is, why are we so afraid to change? Is there any way to turn, I really do want to hear my computer on this. Do we know how to turn this thing up? How many of you all have seen the movie Saved? Yes! Oh, I don't think it's coming out over here. But there's some sound somewhere. So this is a scene from Saved I want you to watch. Hit it! The sound should be coming from the projector. Oh, cool. I hear it from somewhere. Okay, so this, I'm just gonna mind what he says. It's just like, hey, we need you to go help Mary because she's backsliding right now. I think you're the one to do it. Can you like do something about her? And then this girl right here says, um, are you thinking like shooting her? And he's like, what? He's like, no, I was thinking of something a little less gangster. 
and she's unfazed by that because she wants to, she's the Enneagram 8 too. <laughs> and she's like, Mandy Moore's like, girl, I know exactly how we're gonna get her. Currently in the background, the exorcism theme is playing. She's walking down home, this is uh, Mary right here. And then all of a sudden this van pulls up and she's like, hold, what? And notice she's like, oh my gosh, this seems really, really weird, but it's, she's like, get her, get her, throw her in the van. And it's like, oh my gosh. And they all go to the same Christian school together, by the way. And so she shoves it in there and then Mandy Moore holds up a Bible and says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command the demon inside to leave her. And she says, are you doing exorcism? Get away from me! And pushes her out of her. And she says, Mary, you are sliding back into the backwards of hell. Jesus loves you! And she's like, are you fucking joking? She didn't say fucking, no. Um, and she says, just like, you know, you're, you're in the devil's playground. And she's like, no, I don't want your exorcism. I don't want your help right now. And then she's like, you know, something about sin. And she says, oh my gosh, you're one to talk. What about the promise keepers accomplished last year, Linda? <laughs> uh, and she says, you are making accusations. We're trying to save your soul. And then she says, you are something, something. And then Jesus loves you. I said, you don't know the first thing about love. Starts to walk away. I am filled with the love of Christ. You're <laughs> filled with my success in the Lord. And she says, this is not a weapon. You idiot. She has a few. <laughs> I love this movie. It's so nice. Hi, welcome to Bad Lip Dumb. <laughs> so why are we so afraid to... I need more of that. <laughs> if you want more of that, you can tune into my podcast, The Tiny Revolution. <laughs> um, so we're afraid... I, I think a lot of us, at least, like, maybe within our, like, queer communities, we feel fine talking about sex positivity and all these things, because like we're with our people, right? But like, what about like my mom, for example? My mom is someone who is, a, she's a very Southern lady. She's beautiful, she's kind, she loves me so much. But like, I don't know how to talk to her about this stuff. She doesn't hurt, involve herself with my work. My mom, like, she knows I'm gay and that I do these things, but she doesn't really know what I do. And I don't know how to talk to her about that yet because I'm still, in some ways, I think I'm dealing with my own shame of not wanting to lose my mother to thinking that I am everything that they warned her about. <laughs> Anybody resonate with that? Yeah. All them homosexuals do is hook up with each other and they, you know, have sex and they're gonna die of AIDS. That's what we all heard. And so and now that we know that it's not true, that you can actually have abundant life as an openly queer person, we're so afraid to take the next step into saying, actually, sex is a good thing. My body's a good thing. My desire is a good thing. Because we're afraid of things like that. Like, even from what, like, you know, like, within this community, we have some... I'm not, I, I have a few people that I've met who are very strict about, you should wait till marriage, you're giving the, it's respectability politics. It's saying I have to look a certain way, be a certain way in order to get access so that we can look like everybody else. Normalcy is not the goal, people. I do not give a shit about being normal, because you know what? The Billy, the Billy Graham Foundation does not give a shit about me. Franklin Graham Jr., I do not give a shit what he has to say about me. I do not work for the approval of another person because when the God of all matter says that I matter, that is where I'm going to go. I do not, we do not need the approval. We do not need a permission slip from the gatekeepers to say, it's okay for you to have sex. No, you know who gave you your permission slip? The God who lives inside of you. Come on, somebody. Now it comes the interactive portion of this, forming your own sexual ethic. Um, if you're somebody in here and uh, who, uh, I don't know, I'm just gonna keep going. I think there's around like three kind of like common sexual ethics, which is the first one, abstinence until marriage, which is um, the one that we are not about whatsoever. There is the next one, which is sex between two people in committed partnership. Um, I used to be there because, again, I had a lot of evangelical tapes running around in my head saying, this is what sex is for. And I was like, oh, I just, I just want to, I want to, I'm, I'm a normal 23 year old human and I'd really like to have sex now. That's really what it was. And just like, I need to figure this shit out. And we'll get around to my experience in a second. Um, and then we've got this one. Sex between uh, two or more consenting adults, also known as ethical sluts. Um, I don't personally identify as an ethical slut, although like my behavior falls into that category. <laughs> Only because like, I don't really resonate with the word slut so much. Some people are into that and like more power to you. I just like to say that um, uh, sex is good and pleasure is nice. That's where I live. And that's also like from like the ethos of the book called The Ethical Slut. Even if you're somebody who is not going to engage in non-monogamy or polyamory, 
everyone should read this book because it talks so much about how we form relationships, how we communicate our needs and get our needs met. Um, monogamous folks have so much to learn from poly folks, and I also think that poly folks have so much to learn from married folks and blah, 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 blah. Anyways, that's why we're having the wider table, right? Um, this is kind of where I live uh, for myself. I think, again, descriptive, not prescriptive. Me having sex with multiple people might not be good for you. You know, you might be somebody who I only experience a good sex when I actually have a emotional connection with somebody. That's dope. I want you to do that. You might be somebody who says like, I come alive at orgies. And I want to be like, that's dope. <laughs> I think, you know, just like where there is consent and respect, I think there the Lord is also. So for me, um, we talk about, we were talking about fruit, right? We're talking about, hello fruits. Um, we were talking about uh, fruit and knowing the fruit of it. So like in my experience of sex, which I've only been really having sex for like three years now, um, because I didn't come out till three years ago, and I had like this crazy just like developmental spurt, and you, here I am, I don't know how it happened either. <laughs> but sex for me caused me to really examine um, the shame I was carrying around my desire, even with my partner who, um, God bless him, he was very unhealthy. And that caused me to have shame within my own personhood. Uh, it caused me to feel bad about like looking at another guy who's just like might be attractive. Like he got mad at me that I had lunch with my friend Michael McBride, who's so he's the guy in the pink shirt from this morning who's so hot. You know what I'm saying? I flirted with him. He knows that I think he's hot. Um, but the, the other the other part of sex that I realized is like as wonderful as it is, as much as it caused me to examine like my desire and things I wanted, what I thought about relationships. Um, it's also delightfully monotonous. No, nothing? I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah. This is why you test out your jokes at the conference where you're not getting paid. Um, I think sex can be delightfully monotonous because um, I remember the first time I had sex and actually orgasmed with another man. I was like, wow, is it? Oh, and not like that's it, like I was displeased, like orgasms are great, right? Um, but it was one of those things where it's just like, why am I, why was I waiting? That's it? God did not like, you know, come out of the sky like, hey girl, like what you doing? <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, Jesus, Jesus did not come knock on my door just like, hello? Behold, I stand at the door and knock, what are you doing? <laughs> and then like, you know, like, I'll be over there in the corner like, um, nothing. <laughs> But that's but that's it's just like in my experience and I think that if you are someone who's sexually active in here, can you like report that's pretty pretty true? Just like sex is wonderful, but it's also just like you know, it's 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 a thing. It's not something that like now, granted, like, people have different thoughts about, like, how sex interacts and just, like, it's a, some people see it as a spiritual thing. I, I honestly, I still see sex as spiritual. I see, still see sex as special. Um, if I'm hooking up with somebody, that does not mean it's less special than if I was having sex with someone who I, with I was a partner. Woo! My sexual ethic, which we'll get into in just a little bit, is, like, I want to love the person who's in front of me as much as I can. I, and, like, there's just something about having that kind of, like, physical intimacy of giving someone pleasure. And I don't see, like, I, I often, I've remarked before, just like, I would have sex with most of my friends, to be honest, because I love pleasure and I love people. I have a lot of love I want to give, and, like, maybe that could be expressed in some ways. A lot of people are not down with that, obviously. You can ask my friend Grayson, like, I think he's so cute, and I offer to make out with him all the time. <laughs> I was like, do you want to make out? He's like, no. I'm like, all right. Do you want to watch Drag Race? Yeah. <laughs> I think there's one important question. If you're somebody in here who's coming out of purity culture, there's still a lot of tapes that we have, right? A lot of scripts that say, oh, I don't know about sex, or I don't, I don't know if I want to have like all the sex in the world, maybe I just want to wait till I have a relationship. That's fine. And I think there are certain questions that we can ask to say, kind of check in with ourselves and say, are you ready to have sex? And it's like, why? Who do I want to do this for? For myself or somebody else, or maybe want to do it mutually? That's great. Um, am I as prepared as I can be? And I think having uh, queer Christians and just Christians in general have a subpar sexual education, right? Um, I didn't, I didn't, oh my god, and let me tell you about like, a subpar sexual education. The first time I had sex with a dude, uh, had a condom, because I was an RA at the time and I was always giving condoms out to my uh, residences, 
Residencies? I don't know the plural. I'm not a grandma. Residence. Residence. Residencies, that's it? Residence. Residence. It's like deer, right? That's the deers, yeah. not deers. Okay, cool. Um, but I didn't, I mean, the only porn, like, I just, like, watched porn, and, like, it was, like, one minute they're, like, making out, and then, like, the next minute they're fucking, and uh, there's nothing in between. So I knew, like, the mechanics of putting on a condom, right? And so we're there, and we're, like, getting in position, and I put the condom on, and he says, do you have any loot? And I said, no. And I'm like, oh, damn it. And then he said, it's okay, just you spit. And I'm like, all right. And I don't know anything about sex, so of course, that's what I tried. And then, lo and behold, as we were beginning the sex act, he says, no, 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 wait, take it out. I'm like, oh my god, I've heard him, I've heard him, I've heard him. And he runs to the bathroom and throws up because he was really, really drunk, and I didn't realize how drunk he was, and so we stopped. And then, even after he threw up, he still wanted me to have sex with him. I was just like, no, you just threw up. <laughs> I still spooned him, though. <laughs> he just needed to be held. Um, subpar sexual education, y'all. Now, uh, if I'm traveling somewhere, I always have condoms and loot because you never know when the moment's gonna strike. Um, and, you know, I'm not gonna like, rely on somebody else to take care of my sexual health. Um, let's talk about identifying some values real quick. What are values? Um, I think values, um, actually, have, how many of y'all actually read the QCF um, list of values when talking about sexual ethics that they were named next door? Go online and check it out. It's actually really brilliant. Where's my phone? It's being my camera, I can't access it, fine. Um, but basically, they're talking about respect, consent, fidelity, meaning you're gonna do what you say you're gonna do, love, um, service. These are my personal values, to give you some idea. I believe in Imago Dei that the divine is in me and in others, respect, and because of that, everyone is, is God. And so therefore, I must love them as best I can. Honesty is huge for me, because I wanna say what I feel and think without fear of repercussions, because that's really what selfless love is. Um, Curiosity, when I encounter something that makes me uncomfortable, I want to understand why, and I don't want to shame people just because I don't understand it. Um, and I would also say that goes the same for um, uh, uh, side A Christians to side B Christians. If you don't have any side B friends, I think side B theology is toxic and harmful, and I also respect the autonomy of every individual to make their own choices. And I'm never gonna be somebody who's gonna say they can't be in this community. I just wanna say that for the record. Um, integrity, I want to be someone who acts in congruence with my values. I want to be someone who, as much as possible, lives what they preach. So, um, on your phone, or if you have a pad of paper in front of you, um, uh, try to, for two minutes, like a 60 seconds or something, just write down some of your own values. Um, maybe some of your values include uh, faithfulness, in which case you're gonna have to define faithfulness. And you can also like take out a note on your phone, or don't participate at all if you don't want to, because this is a choose your own adventure kind of day. <laughs> um, and, or maybe if you just want to call it out, what are some of your personal values that you, that you carry with, uh, in your life, period? General values. Authenticity. Authenticity. Loyalty. Loyalty. Kindness. 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 Do what? Respect my mother. Respect my mother, come on. Vulnerability. Vulnerability. Honesty. Honesty. Dignity. Dignity. These are all good things. So how do our values impact our sexual choices? I think it's in the same way that we would do anything else. Like, I think that you can have uh, honesty with someone like I want to have sex with you and how many times have you been pressured into sex at least me because grinders a thing right um, so my question is like what do we bring to our own relationships what do we bring to sex and relationships this is what I think I bring to sex and relationships um, open honest communication I'm pretty blunt um, desire never being stigmatized because um, I think it was Freud who said that there's no desire so out there that you can't name it um, and I think that's true. I think you can desire that you should be able to name all of your desires and then based on the fact if your desire is like taking away the autonomy or agency of another person, then obviously that's unethical. Um, patience. I bring patience because just like I'm still learning how to do the good sex. I don't know all the things. I don't feel like comfortable in my own body all the time. Um, I am responsible for my own feelings and my partners are responsible for their feelings. I need to own my feelings. When I'm feeling jealous, when I'm feeling angry, when I'm feeling like um, you're not spending enough time with me, that's, that's me. I am responsible for those feelings. Um, uh, and making sure that my, I'm responsible for making sure my needs are met and communicated. And if my partner or the person I'm with cannot meet those needs, it is my job to find somehow to meet those needs. Because like, they can only do so much. If someone says, I don't have the spoons right now to listen to you complain 
about the mean people on Twitter, Kevin, I'd be like, you know what? I'll call my friend. She's all about the Twitterverse. Um, but again, the same thing with like sex. It's like, hey, I don't want to have sex right now. Okay, I'll go masturbate. It's, it's, it's that simple as communicating our needs. And the thing about it is, it's like we don't ever ask for what we want. What is wrong with asking for what we want? I believe it is always okay to ask as long as you're always okay with hearing no. That is a lesson that um, misogyny could learn a lot from. There's nothing wrong with saying, hey girl, I want to have sex with you, but if she says no, use up, oh, cool, bike. <laughs> it's as simple as that. But the thing is people are not okay with hearing no, especially people who have power. And sometimes we have to like, and I also recognize just like, you know, maybe a woman doesn't want to be approached as a whole lot of things. You have to think about power dynamics a lot. That's another talk for another time. But I think asking for what, I, what we want is the thing that we should be examining. The next thing I think, and don't worry, we're getting towards the end because I know like we're running short on time. Um, my question is, how do you want to feel? Like, how do you want to feel when you wake up, uh, when you're having sex, when you're driving your car, when you're at a conference with a bunch of your best friends? How do you want to feel? What are the things, like for example, um, I've taken so many naps this weekend. I, I, yesterday I did, I did my podcast and then I went to sleep for like four hours and I was still tired after that. Because I wanted to feel good today. That's basically what it is. In my sex life, I want to feel like I trust the person. I want to feel uh, good. I want to feel like I can meet their needs and they can meet mine. Um, I want to feel at the end of it that like, this is something special and it wasn't just something shameful or trashy. This is something lovely. And I think there's a couple things that hold us back. Uh, within shame and desire, um, we feel shame around the things that we actually like. Like I am somebody who like, I like a little power play in the bedroom. I like, you know, a little bit of like choking. I like, you know, like just things that other people might not like or might not be into. But there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that some people aren't into it. I need to be okay with like owning my desire. So my question, like, what do you want? What are the things that you're not willing to talk about? I, I honestly think there's nothing too weird. There's somebody out there that's into you. That's another thing too. Everybody is sexy. You are somebody's type no matter what you look like. We don't. I even have sex with guys who are like seriously hotter than me so that I know that I could get it, okay? The leaves don't exist. I think another thing is like we don't even know what we need or what we want, right? We don't know because we haven't spent any time doing it because we don't lack anything because we have la a lack of experience. So I think that's something that we have to figure out. We have to identify what, what do I need right now? Do I need sex? Do I need someone to listen to me? Do I need someone to uh, cook dinner for me? I don't know what it is. What do I want? I want to have really, really good sex. I want it to be sweaty. I want to do it in a tent at Wild Goose Festival while Amy Grant is playing in the background. <laughs> um, ask me later, I'll tell you that story. <laughs> I think another thing to do, we're afraid of, of fucking it up, we're afraid of screwing up, we're afraid of hurting people, which I will totally say I have done that. I have been the asshole. I have been the person who ghosted people. Um, I try not to do that now. I try to just communicate directly now and say, hey, it was so nice. Um, for example, like, um, uh, over Pride Weekend, I hooked up with this guy, and I told him while we were having dinner, I said, hey, I don't want to go on another date with you, but I do want to have sex with you because you're very attractive, and that's what I want. What do you think about that? You know what he said? Hell yeah. <laughs> and that's also, that's my flirting style. It's like, do you want to make out with me? And sometimes it works. Like last time I was at the literature's gathering, I made it with the guy backstage, and it was like, really simple. I ask for what I want, and it's nice, it's fun. But the thing is just like, within that, we're gonna screw it up, and we have to make sure that our actions are not taking away other people's agency, causing people emotional strife, especially here what we know. Our dear friend St. Paul said, everything is permissible and not everything is beneficial. I'm not friends with Paul, I don't know her, I'm still working with her. <laughs> um, but that's what I have to think about. Um, this is how I kinda, this is kinda like where I have my framework. It's like, sex should be fun, full of consent, and able to be stopped at any time. And also, I, I call it, rather than sexual ethics, I think framework is a good way to say it too, because these things are movable. Over time, as I accumulate experience, these values or these uh, ethics might change. There's also a difference between sexual ethics and sexual practices, I might add. So like, we can unpack that later. Or not, I don't know, we don't run out of time. Um, I wanna be aware of my HIV status and take all the steps to remain sexually healthy. Uh, trust, respect, kindness, concern for my partners is a priority. That big one in red, I am responsible for my own choices and will own my mistakes when I make them. 
I have not always been that way, and I um, still owe somebody an apology. Um, you know who you are. Is that weird to say? I don't know. Uh, this is, I just try to be really vulnerable in public and like authentic, you know what I'm saying? Um, this is, if I had like a mission statement for my sexual ethic, this is it. I want to love whoever I am with as best I can for as long as I am with them. In whatever circumstances we face, our, face find ourselves in, knowing that the best way to love others is also to love myself and to make sure that I'm emotionally and physically healthy so I can give big love to everyone. That's my sexual ethic. Um, I want to have a quick note about sexual health. You know? If you are having sex, you need to be getting tested, period. Okay? Like, and it's be, being tested is not scary. I know that everyone's like, you need to get tested. And like, everyone has like information aversion and they don't want to like get tested because what if I have something? Then get it treated. Here's the thing. Um, if you're having sex, you, like, you stand the chance of getting an STI, even if you protect it. Like, I have a friend of mine who, first time he had sex with his boyfriend, uh, caught chlamydia. And they didn't, they didn't know, it was just there somehow. Like, you know, we don't know where it came up, it just happened. STIs are not a punishment for having sex, they're a byproduct. You're going to, like, it's gonna happen. Um, there is, and there's also ways to continue to like make sure you're staying healthy. How many of you guys know what PrEP, excuse me, how many of you humans know what PrEP is? For those of you who don't know what PrEP is, PrEP is a medicine that uh, is basically preventative. Uh, when you're taking it, 99% of the time, HIV cannot be transferred, cannot be uh, contracted. And also, if you're someone who's HIV positive, there are amazing drugs out there that help you live sustainable, healthy lives and get you to a status of undetectable, which means you can't transmit HIV to somebody else. And it's time we end the shame around AIDS and HIV. Come on, somebody. <laughs> so if you're having sex with someone you don't know, please use a condom. Um, I will say this, if uh, female-bodied individuals who are having sex with other female-bodied individuals, what I'm told, I have, I have never had sex with a female-bodied individual before, but what I'm told is that um, typically barriers aren't used because the, the statistics of STIs are a lot lower. Um, the sex educator in me is like, oh, you should still try to use barriers, but also at the same time, what is your level of acceptable risk? For example, uh, a lot of guys who are on PrEP, uh, this is my experience, they don't want me to use a condom. They want me to bear back it. And I'm like, oh, okay, are you absolutely sure? Because I know my status, I keep up with that. And if you're okay with this acceptable level of risk, if like, you don't know me, but you want me to have sex with you, then okay. It's, a, it's all about, I think like, being willing to figure out what your acceptable level of risk is is very important. And probably another talk for another time. Let's talk about female sex ed. Female sex ed, right there. Thank God, also. I'm, I'm just so sad I'm never gonna be able to have like, the experience of the female orgasm. Because like I heard it's amazing. Multiple <laughs> orgasms. I, like one of my uh, one of my good Judy's. She's a really old lesbian. She said it's like it's like making love with your whole body. And I'm like, what's that like? <laughs> I'm gonna finish this up because I know we're running a little over. This is this is the ethos here. Pleasure is good. Sex is nice. If you want to be somebody who's having sex, respect. Consent, ongoing, uh, enthusiastic consent. Um, know that you can opt out at any time. Know that you can slow down at any time. Know that just because you've had sex with someone now doesn't mean you have to have sex with them later. Even if you're in a relationship with them, you own your body. Amen. Come on, somebody. Um, and uh, honestly, like if if I wasn't having sex, I I definitely just would. I, my life is so much richer. Like I know myself so much more. I love myself so much more. Like, I've been saying it all weekend, I was like, oh, whatever, I love myself. And that's the truth. I love myself. I love this body, and it's like jiggly in certain places, and I got like acne scars in weird places. You know what happened to, you know, like my hairline is like uh, doing a migration to like my back. <laughs> and it's like, Trump, if you wanna put it in the wall, like put it right here to stop <laughs> that from happening, you know? If you come to my other sessions, I've used that joke before. I'm just kidding. Yeah, so that's that's pretty much it. Like, my again, my experience is descriptive, not prescriptive. Your sexual ethic might differ from somebody else in, in like nuances, and that's okay. You need to figure out only you can figure out what's going to work for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, like you're going to encounter shame. You're going to like maybe you're going to go have sex with like you know your partner, and so like oh my god, I still feel weird about that. That's okay. 
Like, it's all about, just name it. When you feel shame come up, when you feel weird things come up, when you feel the trauma start to trigger you, name it. Allow it to come to the light. Process it with somebody who loves you that you can, uh, that you know is gonna hold space for you. Um, I love you, and I really want you to have better sex. Thank you. <laughs>